Those dirty little pigeons, they love a bit of it. This is me doing the day job. Not making my own music, but playing other people's. Being a DJ is not a bad life, especially when your studio's bang in the heart of Soho. A part of London I've known and loved since I was a mere slip of a lad. In my years, I've probably traversed its highways, byways, and indeed dark and alleyways many times. But still it surprises me. You never know who you're going to bump into next, or what surprise will be awaiting you around the next corner. Which is probably why I keep coming back for more. In these programmes, I'll be visiting some of my favourite haunts and catching up with some other well-known characters who share my passion for this fabulous place. It's a tough job, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. In today's programme, I'll be taking a tipple with Molly Parkin at the legendary Colony Room Club. I was introduced to this raffish, bohemian, extraordinary life here, and I couldn't tear myself away. It was like returning to the womb. And rustling up a risotto at my favourite Italian restaurant. <laughs> Bellissima! But first, I'm meeting up with Stephen Fry, who's been a Soho regular since the 80s, when the district removed itself from the grip of vice and was reborn as London's media hotspot. By day, it is a place for voiceovers and uh, film editing and uh, all that kind of thing. When I first came here, uh, you'd see now, uh, this time of day, you'd see young lads with long hair and film reels under their arm going from place to place. So it was, I was drawn to it simply because you had to be here. It was a professional place. Stevens rashly challenged me to a game of snooker at his club. Our road to sporting excellence takes us down Berwick Street Market, which is handy because I've got a spot of last-minute shopping to do. See the new bananas have arrived, that's great. Oh, yeah. Fresh bananas, are. you can't beat fresh They're ones, can you? Yeah. Ain't got any straight ones, have you? <laughs> Excuse me, um, don't have any grapefruits, do you? How much is that, please? It may seem a little rude that I'm catching up on my shopping in the middle of our nice chat, but I'm cooking up a little surprise for Stephen later in the show, and grapefruits are a vital ingredient. A couple of grapefruits, very good. All will, all will be revealed, Stephen. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. You're going to go for drag or something? <laughs> are, they, are they to pad you out? Mm, no. No. Fair enough. It's, it is naughty, Soho. You mustn't forget that. No matter, forget markets and all the rest of it. And here's Walker's Court, there's the Spankarama, there's the Raymond Review Bar, of course, the Tattoo Shop, Harmony Adult Centre. But I remember when I used to live in St James's, which is kind of the other side of Piccadilly, and, I, and, and every night I'd be at the Groucho Club that way, and at about three in the morning I'd totter home along, uh, along Brewer Street there, and at the end of the alleyway there would always be these girls, you know, prostitutes, which is what you would expect at three in the morning in Soho. And I, so I'd, I'd get to know them and they'd, they'd ask me for cigarettes and all the rest of it. And I remember one night I was stopping and chatting to them and I felt something very strange on the back of my head, kind of like warm, and I put my hand up. It's the place for strangeness on the back yeah, of the head, that the alley. smell. It's disgusting. I don't know if I want to know any more of this story. Someone had thrown an egg at me. And I got, what? And they said, oh, it's him. I said, what do you mean, him? They said, oh, no, it's this man. He, he's got a weird religious thing about prostitutes. And he, he drives around three or four, five in the morning. He throws eggs at us or our johns or clients, you know, and he obviously thought you were a client. So and I had to go home and I, just, I could swear I still sm smell it to this day sometimes. I don't know you that well, Stephen, but I can imagine you weren't after the wares of the ladies of the night. You're quite right. <laughs> if anyone were innocent of such a design, it were me. But there you go. That's the Soho experience. I'm glad for Stephen's sake that that incident didn't get into the papers. I can just see the headline. Fry egged over easies. Get it? Mm. A quick cut through Walker's Court and we've arrived at our destination. The Groucho Club. But here you see the famous duck, uh, which is the symbol on account of um, Groucho Marx and duck soup. This is the place where media people go to avoid the media. They don't like cameras in here, but Stephen smuggled me in upstairs so I can thrash him at snooker. At least that was the plan. You've just done it to me, haven't you? You just said I'm, the break isn't my forte. <laughs> well, I, do, it's it it's a fluke. I'm really hoping. <laughs> Believe me. No, you uh, wait. You'll on, see. Yeah. And so you came to Soho firstly as an actor. 
Yeah, yeah. And are you still a fan of Soho generally, Stephen? Oh, yes. And one of the things about it is it's, that it's different according to the hour of the day. Yeah. And that's, you know, Mayfair's always Mayfair. It's just the same. But Soho is, uh, you know, you've got, you've got the day when all the media people are going around with their, what well, used to be with their filming cans. And then, you know, you've got the girls and the freaks and the drug addicts and the, everybody else come out uh, and stay out till late at night. You know, you may well find yourself in that situation, looking for somewhere else to go, and there's always somebody who knows somewhere that you've never heard of, and you've been yes. here 35 odd years. And you get trapped like that Scorsese movie after hours, you know, that film yes, where yes. you just somehow find yourself going on to one place and another. You never know how you're going to get home, whether the people you're with are actually safe or... Well, you've freak. lost all the people that you know, and yes. you're now tagged on to this <laughs> crew exactly. of people you've never met in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Marvellous. Great. Well, good technique there. Do you like that bridging? <clears throat> it is, of course, a very difficult game. It is. When sober. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, there. Oh, sometimes oh. those. But there's a window of opportunity, isn't there? After a couple of games, you're feeling great, and you actually are playing OK, but yeah. it literally is only a couple of minutes. When you're in the zone. Exactly. I mean, one of the great things about Soho is there are no buses. Um, if you think of it as being like this snooker table, in fact, you've got, on one side you've got Oxford Street, and then on this side you've got... Um, Shaftesbury Avenue. These are the pimps and the pimps. Yeah, you've got Regent Street that end and Charing Cross Road that end, and it's more or less a square. And within that square, there are no buses. So it gives it a very special atmosphere. I mean, often people can have been in Soho for years and well, not noticed that. You know that I had never noticed that. Didn't you? <laughs> and that's one of the great joys, of course, is because you're on foot all the time and you yeah. may walk distances that you certainly wouldn't normally in London. And that's why you bump into people that you haven't seen for a while and all those other lovely exactly. things that only happen here. Exactly right. I think it's time to turn the tables on Mr. Fry. He's racking up far too many points for my liking. Cue the grapefruits. Much as a gentleman hates to interrupt a game of snooker, the fact that you're beating me by some considerable margin, and you're on the yellow, yeah. I thought it was about time we, we livened the game up a little. Now, try potting that, Steve. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I've got for you here are a few quite interesting facts. As, as the world-renowned font of all knowledge, oh, no. you saw me purchase this item earlier. And now what I'd like to know firstly here, Stephen Fry, is what is the connection between the grapefruit and Soho? The grapefruit? OK, I'm going to have to put yeah, you out of your misery. Me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No idea is the answer. A Berwick Street market trader called Jack Smith introduced the grapefruit to London in 1890. Get out! Hey. That's good! And a pair of grapefruits have been a very useful thing ever since. <laughs> Especially for the transvestites. But unfortunately, his campaign to have the fruit named after him ran out of juice <clears throat> when it was revealed he was actually a convicted melon. <laughs> Hold on, we're going to get... We're going, we're going a bit more... I know, sorry. I'm we're, loving we, it. We're, 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 we're scraping the barrel of insulin. We're, we're going to go a bit more highbrow here now, Stephen. OK, now, we've got the Communist Manifesto here, Stephen. Oh, yes. Now, what do we reckon as to the reason why I'm holding the Communist Manifesto in Soho? Well, further... I do know this, I hope I do, anyway. Further along in Dean Street, uh, in what is now the Cro Vardis uh, restaurant, there you'll find a, one of English Heritage's blue plaques saying Karl Marx, and uh, Marx was in, in Soho. Fantastic, well done. Ten out of ten, yes. Uh, above Cro Vardis, the, uh, the famous Italian restaurant. In fact, he was almost penne-less. <laughs> when he inherited some cash and then moved on to Kentish Town, but it's very true. Now, Mr. Fry, what is it, what, what important part did coffee have to play in the history of Soho? Ah, have I stumped you again, Mr. Fry? You could do, do a whole documentary series mm. on coffee houses of London from the 17th century onwards when famously Charles II closed them down. He's playing for time. They became the literary meeting places of London for a long time, but most of them weren't in Soho, was it? No, it had nothing to do with literary society. It was, in fact, that London's first espresso was made by machine in Frith Street. Of course. That of course, of course. All those wonderful m movies with frothy coffee in, in glass cups and all that. It was indeed the Café Mocha in Frith Street, which became known to the locals as Froth Street. Hey, there we are, good. beautiful Frost stuff. Street. Right, hold on, we've got something else. We sent someone out to one of those mucky bookshops out there. We've got a, oh, nice, yeah. a nice glossy magazine for you here. Oh, the TV Times. Times. Oh, the TV, TV Times. Times. I never knew there was so much in there. <laughs> what do you think the connection could possibly be between, let's say, television in general and Soho? Oh. Ooh. Did Logie Baird live here? 
Goodness me, eh? even if you don't know, you can make very <laughs> well informed <laughs> guesses. Cute guess. Well, I should say it was John Logie Baird transmitted his first TV pictures from his attic workshop in Frith Street wow. once again. He paid a local office boy half a crown to appear on screen. But I reckon if he'd had Jonathan Ross's agent, he would have got the full crown. <laughs> Congratulations. I well, think you've got 35 you. points out of a possible 50. <laughs> thank you. Well, it's fantastic. So much to know there about is. Soho. But it's interesting you talk about this because we're in the Groucho Club. I have a, my absolute rule about the Groucho Club is that anything you say, no matter how profound, if you were Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Voltaire, Shakespeare, Robbie Williams and in his pomp. Aristotle, all combined, no matter what you said, however true it was, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. If you add the words he said last night in the Groucho Club, it instantly disqualifies whatever you've said from making sense or being acceptable. Can you imagine that? Workers of the world unite, he said last night in the Groucho Club. You just go, piss off. Of course, not all of Soho's clubs are quite as glitzy as the Groucho. In fact, some of them are quite a bit older and have a unique charm of their own. And one of my favourites is just across the rooftops air conditioners and fire escapes over there. And this is, in fact, the way I used to go there. It was the quickest, shortest route between drinks. You may end up with a broken leg, but who cared? Fortunately, they put a lock on here now. So today, I'll be using the main entrance. Coming up later, why don't you join me and Molly Parkin for a drink at the Colony Room Club and find out the secret of real risotto. <laughs> I'm not the world's greatest cook. In fact, I failed the auditions for Celebrity Master Chef on the grounds that my signature dish of jacket potato with beans and cheese served on a bed of oven chips lacked imagination. But in Soho, you never need to cook. You've got all the flavors of the world served up in a square mile of culinary delight. If you don't fancy French or Greek, you could always head to Gerard Street. And here in the fabulousness that is Chinatown lies all the diversity of Chinese cuisine. If you have an interest in the difference between Cantonese and Sichuan, five spice or even ginger spice, this is the place for you. After a night on the sauce, this is the perfect place for a spot of chow. And if you have the inclination to cook some authentic Chinese food, it's all here. Bak choy, pok choy, kai choy, choy sum, gai choy and tomatoes. But today I fancy a spot of Italian, which is why I'm heading for one of my favourite restaurants, Little Italy. It's run by a good mate of mine, Anthony Pelledri. The restaurant is part of the family catering empire, which started with that great Soho institution, Bar Italia, just a couple of doors down the road. Anthony's worked for the family business since he was a teenager. It was my grandfather and grandmother, then my father, and he was involved in other businesses as well. And uh, I just felt that I really wanted to be a part of that. And uh, um, it, it just it seemed natural. I came to work in a summer holiday and never went back to school. What were your earliest memories of being around here? Soho was just a, a restaurant community and, and a haven for all the Italians. So when they used to finish a shift, they would come to Bar Italia, all congregate, all meet. People used to find jobs, used to talk about work, talk about politics, talk about everything. And uh, it, it played its part, uh, Bar Italia, in the Italian community, which is, uh, I think, one of the reasons why it's still here today. It still plays its part. It's not just the coffee and conversation that makes this a magnet for London's Italian community. They also come here to indulge in that other great Italian passion, I'm talking about football. I was on holiday in Italy yeah. when the World Cup was on, and it was on the Italian news. I know. I couldn't get away from this place. We had 30,000 people down Frith Street. I yeah. don't think it was yeah. as much as 30,000 subs. But... In my world, it was 30. <laughs> in the Italian news, it was. Uh, it, it, it felt like 30,000 because uh, the crowds just seemed to, to grow and grow and grow until the final came. And then my brother Luigi went downstairs and got all the pasta out the kitchen and was thrown out the windows. So it was raining pasta. And... The chef next day had the right needle because he had no pasta, so we had to run up to Camisa and buy some pasta to get us going. But there was trampled pasta in the streets as well as Prosecco. Health and safety issues here, you could have taken someone's eye out with that. <laughs> Thank God England didn't win, we've been raining potatoes down, haven't they? Eh? <laughs> All that talk of pasta's got me feeling peckish. In fact, I'm so hungry, I'm going to cut out the middleman and have a bash at rustling up my own lunch. Ah, the engine room of the restaurante, not a, a place I'm very used to. The kitchen, is it? Yeah, come on, stick one of these on, we'll make some risotto. Come on. 
Well, this is it, the beautiful stuff I've eaten upstairs many times. And, uh, Well, give it a stir. <laughs> Do you know, it's one of the few things I can make risotto, but it's not as simple as it seems, is it? Because you've got to get that, you've got to get that rice, what's the word? Well, you want to stop it from sticking and you want to stir it slowly and keep it going all the time. It's just something you But it's al dente, is that the word? Yeah, you've got to have it al dente. It's still a bit chewy, yeah, yeah, still a bit yeah, chewy yeah. but not dried out, obviously. A little bit more stock. The best risotto in London, if I you don't so, mind. I so, I so. It's such a simple thing and yet so delicious. Everybody has their own recipe and everybody's, uh, everybody's risotto is the best. Now you can't, I mean, you know, I've, been, I've cooked around Italians before, I can feel it already. Everyone's looking over your shoulder when you cook, because they don't do it as good as their mamma. Everyone's mamma well, does it best, don't they? Exactly, yeah. I'm starting to enjoy this. I wonder if he's got any vacancies. How's that looking, Jerry? That, that looks good. A couple more ingredients, though. A little bit of butter. A knob of butter. A knob of butter. Lovely, yes, that's, that's... Is that enough? Yeah, we don't want to yeah. overdo it. Yeah, and, we've and got our then... waistlines to think of, haven't we? <laughs> I'm getting excited now. This is looking lovely. Perfect. And a little bit of parmigiano. Of course, that gives it that lovely gloss yeah. as well, doesn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, a little yeah. Bit of sheen. Let's take that off the heat now. A little now. bit of sheen, yeah? Okay. Parmigiano. How much do you reckon? A little bit more. Lovely. Okay. Beautiful. Let me stir that in. Stir that in. There you go. Buon appetito. Molto grazie. Grazie molti. Oh, my Italian teacher's going to go mad with you. Santo. <laughs> Bellissima. <laughs> Bellissima! <laughs> it is, though, isn't it? It's one of the great joys of life, whatever life. Risotto, so simple. What do you reckon? Is that ready to plate up? Yeah, yeah. Come on, let's get going. I'm going to eat this. OK. Look at that joy. What do you reckon? The TV career goes well. Buon appetito. I get a job there. You here. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. What do you think? Out of ten. Perfect. Yeah? Yes. More tucker. See, they're nice people, you see. Well, I tell you what, if you fancy a taste of real Italy, you could do a lot worse than coming to Little Italy in Frith Street. Oh, is this? Not too bad. But next time I come, I think I'll leave it to the experts. Salute. After dining at Little Italy, I often take my coffee al fresco at Bar Italia and simply watch the world go by. Yeah. Of course, if you fancy something a little stronger than coffee, there's no shortage of places to choose from. But that wasn't always the case, even in Soho. Nowadays, you can get a drink pretty much any time you like, day or night. But in those very austere years just after the war, the pub shut just after lunchtime and didn't open again till tea time, which left a vast desert of dryness. And to fill the gap, a whole host of drinking dens sprang up all over Soho. And this is one of the most famous, indeed infamous. I can't remember my first visit to the colony room, but I'm pretty sure I got here on a space hopper. And I haven't bounced on one of them for at least 10 years, so it must have been some time ago. Every time I climb the stairs and walk into this tiny bar, it feels like I'm stepping back in time. So, so what's the big one? Eight foot, six foot going for, you said? Yeah. Ten grand. This place has hardly changed since it was first opened by the redoubtable Muriel Belcher in 1948. She used to pay Francis Bacon a tenner a week to bring in friends and rich patrons, and the club soon became the favourite haunt of Soho's artists and bohemians. The club's arty associations attract many non-members to the colony. Current owner, Michael Wojcic, has been known on occasion to let some of them in for a peek at this unique time capsule. I have a whole host of letters from art students from um, the UK and abroad thanking me for letting them come in when they were doing their thesis on Francis Bacon, etc. And the students from London used to go back to their respective colleges with a sort of photograph, they'd take photographs of everything, game catalogues. <laughs> and the tutors would go, Colony Room? How did you get into the Colony Room? <laughs> But it's the members who really make this place special. Molly Parkin and her daughter Sophie are both regulars here. So here we are with a marvellous sight, two generations of colony members. Molly, firstly, what was your first experience of coming in the colony? 
Well, I thought I died and come to heaven. I was introduced to this raffish, bohemian, extraordinary life here, and I couldn't tear myself away. It was like returning to the womb. And I was brought here, like most people, when she was reigning, the queen, that is, uh, we talk of Muriel, sitting on her seat, and uh, she turned around, her eyes lit up. She did like a nice girl, and I was pretty and 22 at the time, just stopped being an art student, and she welcomed me like that every time I came, and she used to cuddle me. She would have had me on her knee, you know, on that stool, if she could have. So we had a big, big bond. One of my earliest memories was coming here as a six, seven-year-old, and Muriel actually putting me on the stool. Of course, the stool is still a, 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 a source of great argument to this day about who sits on Muriel's stool. It's the throne, actually. The throne. Yeah. And Sophie, what's your earliest memory of coming here? Uh, my earliest memory was like you being a child, being brought here and being totally intimidated. But once you've been to the colony and you've got to know the kind of people who come here and the extraordinary characters you can meet, I mean, every time I come here I meet somebody new and they're always interesting. And try that in a pub in Richmond. I think that's very true. I think uh, you do feel very intimidated when you come in your first time and you make that instant decision you're either going to be part of it or you're going to run away and never come back again. The colony is about people who are prepared to jump in at the deep end. There isn't, it isn't a place of caution, let's put it like that. It isn't a, a place of politeness and if it was, we wouldn't be here. Well, I wouldn't. I don't know about my daughter. Oh, I'm far too polite for her. Yes. <laughs> Good company, great conversation and a party atmosphere to boot. What more could you possibly want? Trouble is, before you know it, late afternoon has turned into early morning and you've missed the last tube home. Still, there are worse places to get stuck in than Soho. Well, I say, what a jolly fine evening that was. But I'll tell you what, it's only 2 a.m. and there are still plenty more cellars and bars and underground secret nooks and crannies whose closing time is dawn that I have yet to investigate. And as a very diligent scholar of human life, my work here is not yet done. See ya. Next time on Sucks in Soho, I'll be talking jazz with the legendary George Melly. London, Sin City and all that. Amanda Barry is reunited with an old friend. Oh my God. And Peter Stringfellow tells me about his lifelong love affair with Soho. French model.